One of the weird things about professional football, um, you know how every year they draft uh, quarterbacks out of college, right? And the better the, quarter, the better you think the quarterback is, the higher you draft them, right? You, we think Andrew Luck is the best quarterback in college football. He'll probably go number one in the draft. The person who we think is the tenth best quarterback will go in the fourth round, right? So, a couple years ago, this economist decided that he would see how accurate your draft position was as a kind of predictor of your professional performance. Do the quarterbacks drafted number one end up being better quarterbacks than the quarterbacks drafted number 10 or number 20 or number 50, right? So this guy looked at 50 years of data of hundreds of different quarterbacks, and what he discovered was that the quarterbacks drafted in positions one through 50 ended up having inferior professional careers than the quarterbacks drafted in positions 50 through 150. Right? Now, think about that. That's really weird. The quarterbacks who are drafted at the top of the draft are the tallest, the fastest, they have the strongest arms, the most accurate arms, they have won the most games, they come from the greatest college programs, they have received every encouragement along the way, they have had come from the best coach, they have the best coaches. We can go on and on. I once read, not long ago, a study, a psychological study, which proved that quarterbacks drafted in the first round are better looking than quarterbacks drafted later. These are guys with every single advantage in the world, and yet they are ending up being inferior to quarterbacks who are not as good looking, who's, who are not as, don't have as good an arm, who are not as fast or are not as tall, who haven't won as many games in college, and on and on. How can that be? How can that be? Is it because uh, NFL teams don't know what they're doing? Right? I don't think so. Do they not know enough about football? No, it's not true. Do they not know enough about, aren't they do, are they not doing their homework on these, these quarterbacks? No, that's nonsense. They're like hiring private investigators to interview the person these guys were dating in seventh grade, right? <laughs> they have tons of data on it. So what's the explanation? Well, the explanation is that maybe those quarterbacks who aren't as tall and strong and fast and accurate, who haven't won as many games, who aren't as good looking, compensate for those disadvantages by working harder and being hungrier. And maybe working harder and being hungry is a better predictor of being a great quarterback than having every natural advantage in the world, right? Being a great competitor, in other words, is rooted in overcoming obstacles, not just capitalizing on every advantage that you've been given. That's what the great ones can do. That is compensation. You took something away from somebody and they came back stronger. And that is a key component of a successful competitor. That's what Fleetwood Mac did, right? You took something away from them their leader, success, all the kinds of, of things that we think are the, the, building, the building blocks of, 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 of eventual greatness. And what did they do? They didn't quit. They didn't fold. They compensated. You know, every four years, uh, high school students from around the world are asked to, uh, are asked to take a math test. So a sample of kids from America and Canada and England and Germany and France and Botswana and everyone uh, take the same math test. And it's how we figure out how students from all around the world compare in terms of their math achievement. Right? And uh, so this has been going on for years. And then we rank all of the countries in the world according to how good their students are at math. Well, at the same time that students take this test, they're also asked to fill out a questionnaire. And it's a really long questionnaire. It's like 120 questions long. It's all about your family and your study habits and your ideas about education. And a couple years ago, this uh, psychologist, really clever psychologist, decided that he would rank the countries of the world according to what percentage of questions on the questionnaire the students answered. Because the questionnaire is so long, most students just give up. They don't go right to the end, right? So he decided, let's rank the countries of the world according to how many questions on the questionnaire they answer. And then he said, let's compare that ranking to the ranking of the countries of the world according to how many questions on the math test they got right, right? You know what he found when he compared those two rankings? 
They're exactly the same. In other words, if you want to know how well a country, students in a country do at math, you don't have to ask them any math questions. You only need to give them a task that requires them to sit still and focus for an extended period of time. That's what math is, right? Can you sit? Can you sit in your chair long enough to finish the task in front of you? There's no magic thing called a math gene that some people have and some people don't. There is only a magical thing called, I want to work hard enough to master this, right? That's what it means to be great at math. So that's the first lesson about great competitors. It's a really, really simple, dumb, obvious lesson, which is the greatest competitors work harder than everybody else. Right? It's a simple The lesson. old band members of Fleetwood Mac, before they hit it big, um, and he had sent my friend this email talking about how extraordinary the story of the band was. Um, this, those, those 10 years of trying, those 16 albums before they got it right. And he said, you know what the most amazing thing about that story is? That throughout that 10 year period, when they were flailing and not succeeding and trying everything under the sun and going through all these different iterations, their record label stood behind them at every step of the way. This organization of people stood by them and helped them and nurtured them and gave them advice and supported them and helped them grow and would not abandon them. And that's the piece of the puzzle that I think we are most likely to forget when we look at successful competitors. We sometimes think that they operate in a little bubble all by themselves and that succeeding in the world is just about, is entirely up to you. It's all about what an individual can do. And that's wrong. That when you look closely at the lives of successful competitors, what you invariably see in their corner is a coach, a mentor, an institution that stands behind them, right? That makes the kind of hard work and diligence and experimentation and compensation that lie at the root of successful competition possible. So that would be my final word of advice to all of you. When you think about what it means to be a successful uh, competitor, understand that it's not going to happen overnight, that it requires hard work. Right? Understand that obstacles are things you can learn from, not to be defeated by. Right? Understand that sometimes you have to search for what makes you good. That it's not something that pops up um, immediately in the first month or week or day of tackling some new task. But understand, most of all, that you need a coach, you need a mentor, you need someone in your corner. And if you can find that person, everything else is possible. When you consider success, do you feel that cooperation and competition are mutually exclusive? No, I don't. I think, um, because I think that uh, when we, it goes to the last point I was making about how uh, competitors are never competing by themselves. They're always part of a team, even when they don't seem like they're part of a team. Right? You, you watch a, a, a professional tennis player playing and you think, oh, it's all about Roger Federer or Rafa Nadal. Or you watch, um, you know, some, Anyone in an individual sport, Tiger Woods play golf, and you think he's in an individual sport. That word means nothing. He's not an in, in an individual sport. He has behind him and working with him a whole team of people, people who are cooperating with him and nurturing him and helping him and coaching him. And once you understand that, that you understand that what, what competition is, is groups of cooperators who are challenging each other. That's what it is.